How does an observer assign space and time coordinates to a given event? Trivial, right? We set up the coordinate grid and read it like a graph. But that is on a piece of paper. That's not what I'm talking about. How do we assign coordinate values to these events playing out in the real world? We are going to figure out precisely this. How an observer determines the space and time coordinate values of actual events. Hello and welcome to Physics Next Book. We are currently making a video series on spatial relativity. Hypothetically, an observer can set up the space-time coordinate grid by bringing in an army of fellow observers with synchronized clocks and station them all along the space axis. Their world lines, together with their clock readings, can form the space-time coordinate grid effectively. You can find more on this from the video in the i button, but a hypothetical army of fellow observers is kind of an abstract theoretical idea. Nothing wrong with it, but it is not a practical thing to go for. What we really need instead is something practical, where an individual observer on his own can assign space and time coordinate values to any event in space-time. All he can use are his wristwatch and a flashlight, and of course the laws of relativity. We know that any motion is relative, so we must specify at the outset that the guy drawing the space-time diagram is doing all the observations to assign coordinate values to events here. So we see everything from this observer's perspective and refer to him as the rest frame observer. We name his frame S0 and assume that it is an inertial one. This guy is obviously static in S0, so each point on his world line indicates the same location of space but a different instant of time read by his clock. So his world line serves as the time axis of the rest frame. Let's take B, an arbitrary event point in space-time that the observer wants to assign the space-time coordinates to. Here is what he needs to do. He keeps sending photons from every event point of his world line and keeps track of the time of emission of each photon. One of these photons gets reflected from the event point B and travels back to the observer. He notes down the time of reception of this reflected photon. Let's set a ward. Because he has time stamped each photon with its emission time also, he knows that this reflected photon was emitted at a time instant, let's say tau e. With these two data points, he can find out the spatial distance xb to that event b measured from his location and he can use it as a space coordinate with his own location as the origin. Let's see how this thing works. The particular photon reflected by the event B was emitted at time instant tau e and received at time instant tau r. So its total time of flight is tau r minus tau e. It very conveniently has a constant speed c. So the total distance traveled by the photon during this flight from the observer to B and back is c multiplied by tau r minus tau e and half of it must be the spatial distance between the observer and the event. If you are thinking, but the photon did not go back to where it came from in the picture, think again. It started from the observer and went back to the observer, only at a later time. Since the world line of the observer is the time axis, every point on it indicates the same spatial location of our observer. He is the only observer in this scenario, so his location can serve as the spatial original right. Therefore, the spatial distance of the event B from the observer works as the spatial coordinate XB of the event B and we have figured out what its value is using the two clock readings. Ok, so what about the temporal coordinate of B? To get that, first we have to fix the temporal origin which the observer may choose anywhere on the time axis that is on his world line. Let's say some event point O is chosen by him. Once this choice is made, the origin of the space-time coordinate system is fixed. Spatial distance between O and B is the space coordinate XB that we have already determined. Now let's see what the temporal distance between O and B is. That will work as the time coordinate of B. Since at the moment of reflection the photon has covered the distance XB which is half of the total distance traveled with its constant speed C, the reflection must have happened right at the middle of its total flight duration. So when the reflection happened, the observer's clock must have progressed by half of the total flight duration from the photon emission instant tau e and should read tau r plus tau e by 2. So this is the observer's clock reading at the event b. The time coordinate of b with respect to the chosen origin at o is just the temporal distance between the events b and o. So we subtract the observer's clock reading at event o. 
let's say tau 0 from that at b to get the time coordinate tb. So there you have a way to assign space and time coordinate values to an event. As we have chosen this event at random, it's completely generic. So the method we just elaborated works for all the events all over the spacetime. And since the whole spacetime is nothing but a collection of event points, this is how an observer can set up the entire spacetime coordinate grid single-handedly. Before we wrap, let me quickly point out something. You must have noticed that the method used here is heavily dependent on the spacetime trajectory of photons or the photon world lines and these are 45 degree lines in our diagram. But why 45 degrees? There is an element of choice involved in here which almost never comes up in relativity discussions and thus mostly goes unnoticed. You can watch the video on the right which elaborates on this and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for your time. Bye bye.